Hello viewers, my name is Dr. Manoj Semwal and I am from Army Hospital Research and Referral, Delhi Kent. I am a medical physicist by profession and today welcome to EPG Patshala. I will be talking about radiation carcinogenesis. So as I was discussing with you the objectives of this module, let me just give you a brief overview. Radiation is used in health industry, in nuclear industry, in research and many human activities, sometime knowingly, sometime unknowingly. For example, the aircrafts, the air crew or the passengers that travel in the aircraft also have radiation exposure because coming from the cosmic rays. Then there are sources in your houses. Radon is a gas which is radioactive and giving you radiation. Then there are certain areas in the world, for example in our own country, the Kerala coast, where the radiation from the thorium sand is high, the background radiation is high. So does that high background radiation cause extra risks to the patients or to the people living there? Or is it all right? Or there is one more theory which says that probably radiation may be at low doses may be useful. So these are the questions that we will try to answer in brief in this module. And I will take you through what are the various applications of radiation. For example, in medical field, most of you are aware that imaging, radiography, CT scan, and in cancer therapy, radiation is extensively used and more and more of its applications are coming in the field of medicine. So are in the field of biophysics and chemistry. You have radiation applications for knowing the structure of molecular structures and various other elementary analysis, spectroscopy, for example, X-ray diffractometry for crystal crystallography. These are application of radiation in research. Then in the industry, the nuclear power is one major, major area where radiation is involved and where the risks are known to people. We have all known the radiation uh, accident that happened in Japan a few years back. So because of that, the awareness about radiation protection, radiation risk has increased. Even in our country, a few years ago, there was an incident at Delhi, Mayapuri, where a radiation source was lost and while in a junkyard, it was being recovered by some workers there, they got exposed to radiation and a couple of them were killed because of radiation. So all that has contributed a lot of awareness about radiation, its risks and what are the protection measures that we should take. Similarly, there are many unknown areas where radiation exposure takes place. For example, nowadays you might be hearing about mobile radiation, but viewers, we would not be talking about that radiation here because it does not fall in the category of ionizing radiation. Today, we are strictly dealing with the radiation carcinogenesis because of ionizing radiation, which is X-rays, gamma rays, even at the lower end, ultraviolet rays as well. So the objectives once again to introduce the concept and mechanism of radiation carcinogenesis we would be learning about it. Various cancer risk models and especially we will be focusing on radiation induced cancer risk models. Third we will be discussing about radiation carcinogenesis risk in various spheres of human activity. As I told you in the introduction, radiation is used in wide variety of activities in human life. Now, the basic question is, what is carcinogenesis? It is a process by which normal cells are transformed into cancer cells. Now, the next question would come, what are cancer cells? The most prominent feature of a cancer cell is uncontrolled cell division. We know that body, body cells, most of the cells divide, but they have a controlling mechanism for division as well as for differentiation. 
So if that control mechanism is lost, cell div division takes place in an uncontrolled fashion. And this is one prominent feature of cancer cells. Then carcinogenesis theory, there's one theory which says that there are three steps or processes. First is initiation, where the cellular genes are irreversibly altered. The second step is promotion, where the cells with altered genes expand by self-proliferation leading to abnormal growth. And the third step of the process is progression, where the abnormal cells detach from the primary growth or tumor that we can call and invade other organs and tissues, forming what we call in clinical language as metastatic growths. That means a tumor has started growing not only at the original site where it was formed, but at different location by traveling through blood or lymph fluid. Then a latent period of decades may elapse between radiation exposure and the detection of cancer because detection will happen only when either the person who has developed a cancer shows symptoms of it or it is detectable with the existing modality for, of imaging. At a cellular level, probably you will not be able to see it. That is why there is a period called latent period from exposure till you detect the cancer. And this latent period may vary from few months to few decades. Now, what is initiation? The mutation in the genetic information of a cell is a result of radiation damage at the molecular levels. For example, what kind of damage at molecular levels? Radiation can cause single strand breaks, double strand breaks in the DNA. Generally, it is supposed that it is the double strand breaks that are responsible for later development of carcinogenesis. Now, all these damages, whether single strand breaks or double strand breaks, get repaired. Some get misrepaired and some remain unrepaired. Now, this is the unrepaired ones or the misrepaired ones, damages on the DNA that may later lead to carcinogenesis. Now, genetic alteration can also occur in cells that receive no direct radiation exposure. This is also known and this effect is known as bystander effect. So it is not just the cells which are getting direct radiation that are affected by radiation. It is also the cells which are in the vicinity of the cells getting direct radiation because of the signaling taking place between the cells that they also get affected. And remember, this effect is known as bystander effect. Double strand breaks in chromosomes may lead to what? What kind of uh, structure formations? For example, ring structures, eccentric structures, and dicentric structures of the chromosomes. All these double strand breaks may lead to such changes in the structures of the chromosome. Just for your information, radiation dosimetry, a form of radiation dose measurement, which is called biodosimetry. That means biological indicators are taken for what dose an individual has received. So these dicentric chromosome structures do correlate with the dose an individual receives and can be used for radiation biodosimetry purposes also. So what's clear to you now is the DSBs in chromosomes may lead to ring, eccentric and dicentric structures. Now, the theory, another hypothesis of radiation carcinogenesis is oncogene activation and inactivation of tumor suppressor genes within a cell. That involves activation of proto-oncogenes or loss of tumor suppressor genes due to molecular alteration caused by radiation within the cells. For example, papillary thyroid carcinoma in children is a result of oncogene activation. This has been proven by certain experiments. Then deletion of tumor suppressor gene is attributable for retinoblastoma in children. 
and this have this deletion of gene happens at chromosome number 13 q there are many instances of oncogene activation due to changes in chromosomal structures as we just learned a few minutes ago that dsbs can lead to chromosomal changes and oncogene activation leading to malignancies let me give you some examples for example oncogene andras when it is deleted from chromosome the change in chromosome is deletion and what is it attributable to neuroblastoma the activation of andras happens in a chromosome and it may lead to neuroblastoma similarly c dash myc c mic another oncogene and the change in chromosome structure is translocation this may lead to b cell lymphoma n mic another oncogene and chromosome change involved in this case is translocation this may also lead to neuroblastoma another oncogene hras changes in chromosome certain parts of the chromosome may get deleted and attributable to human cancer sarcoma and make also attributable to burkitt's lymphoma so these are some of the examples where scientists have linked the activation of these oncogenes to certain human cancers similarly there are some common tumor suppressor genes for example, suppressor gene P53, it is in the nucleus of a cell on chromosome 17P. The suppression of this gene is associated with breast cancer. Similarly, suppressor gene P105RB, its location in the nucleus on chromosome number 13Q, attributable to retinoblastoma. Suppressor gene DCC. Where is it located? Surface of the cell on chromosome 18Q and it is attributable to colon cancer. Suppressor gene NF1 located in cytoplasm, chromosome 17Q and the associated cancer with it is neurofibroma. Early human experience, how people came to know that radiation can cause cancer. In fact, initially, there was euphoria when radiation was discovered in the early late 90s in fact 1895 when x-rays were discovered by ronchen euphoria because people could see that x-rays could be used to image internal human body but that euphoria slowly within a decade led to certain gloomy pictures for example people realized that radiation not only can be useful but can cause severe harm so early human experience associated with cancer is skin cancer in early x-ray workers then lung cancer in underground uranium miners in saxony and colorado there was unusually large number of cancer cases lung cancer cases detected there bone cancer in radium dial painters was also detected similarly liver cancer in thorotrast patients what is thorotrast it is a contrast made up of thorium radioactive material. People were being given for radiography purposes, not knowing that this can cause harm because this thorium is radioactive. And later it was realized that since it got deposited into the liver when the patient ingested it, there were liver cancer cases. In fact, Marie Curie and her daughter, Irene Curie, have thought to be died of leukemia as a consequence of radiation exposure during their experiments with radiation. As you know, Marie Curie is known for the discovery of radium and her daughter Irene Curie is known for discovery of artificial radioactivity. Some of the early cases of human experience with radiation carcinogenesis. What are the later human experience? Now, you, most of you may be aware of it and which has become a big repository of knowledge from the analysis of the data that we have gathered for radiation risk. 
and that is the atomic bomb survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That is the largest experience, human experience on what radiation can do. Then second, elevated incidence of leukemia in early radiologists. These radiologists were not taking proper precaution in terms of prote protecting themselves. If you viewers, if you today go to a radiology department, you would find people taking a lot of precautions. The radiologists, the radiographer, early times since they were not aware of it, they did not take those precautions and there were elevation of leukemia risk in those patient, uh, radiologists. Thyroid cancer from treatment of enlarged thymus. Thymus gland in the body is close to thyroid. And for an enlarged thymus, earlier people gave radiation, even though it was malignant or non-malignant. And then later on they found that in those patients, there were increased cases, incidences of thyroid cancer. Similarly, breast cancer in tuberculosis patients who underwent fluoroscopy. A lot of fluoroscopy patients, tuberculosis patients, when they underwent fluoroscopy as a screening procedure, some of them developed breast cancer. Because in early days, fluoroscopy, amount of dose monitoring, what was the dose received by the patient who were undergoing fluoroscopy was not properly known, nor were the effects known properly. As a result, these patients must have got little higher doses and some of them later developed breast cancer. And another important source of radiation carcinogenesis data is the secondary cancers in patients treated with radiotherapy. And viewers, on this account, let me say that as modern equipment delivering radiotherapy have come into the clinic, very precise targeting of tumors with the help of latest imaging modalities is being possible. As a result, what and to couple with this, the early diagnosis of cancer cases in certain advanced societies is happening at a more larger scale. As a result of good technology to deliver radiation and treatment, an early diagnosis of cancer, what we are witnessing is long survival of cancer patient. Now, since these cancer patients survive long, there are chances of secondary cancers in these patients because of radiation. So these are the experiences, clinical experiences that people have analyzed, data has been analyzed on these atomic bomb survivors, early radiologists, tuberculosis patients developing breast cancer and these secondary cancers in patients treated with radiotherapy to predict risks of cancer from radiation. Now, as I, was, I had touched upon a little earlier, that there is a latent period for cancer induction by radiation. Or for that matter, as you would be knowing, there are mutations taking place in our cells all the time due to various mutagens or various agents. They could be chemical, they could be physical, or they could be radiation. Now, the body cells have the repair mechanisms and because those mutations or those damages are being repaired by the cell, it is only when these repairs are not happening properly or are remaining unrepaired that one may develop cancer over a period of time. Now, what are the, the time of exposure from the time of exposure till the cancer develops or detects? As I told you earlier, it's called latent period. Now, what are the latent periods of various cancers? Leukemia has a latent period at least average is nine years or minimum is two to three years. Leukemia is a form of blood cancer. Similarly, bone cancer has a latent period of about 14 years. Breast cancer average latent period is 22 years. Stomach cancer is 14 years. Thyroid cancer is 20 years. And colon cancer has 26 years. But when I am saying that these are the average time period, latent period, this latent period may vary with the age of the patient as well as the dose received. And one interesting phenomenon that happens here is that for leukemia, the incidence of leukemia from the day of exposure increase for about 10 years. For example, if a population is exposed to radiation, for example, as I was discussing earlier, the atomic bomb dropping on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So it happened in August 1945 and then 
Later studies revealed the leukemia cases peaked at around 10 years among the survivors and then leukemia cases slowly, slowly decrease. Whereas the other solid state cancer, solid cancers, the incidence kept increasing and this keeps increasing till date among the survivors or their progenies. So there are various latent periods for different type of cancers, not only depending on the age, but also the dose. Now viewers, we come to risk models. So I must ask you, what is the need of risk models for cancer risk models? And what way will it benefit us? Now please remember, cancers caused by radiation is indistinguishable from the cancers caused by other factors or cancer occurring naturally. A major compounding factor when we do risk modeling. Data from animal studies, nuclear accidents, atomic bomb survivors and medical exposure of patients have been the basis for estimation of radiation cancer risk on human beings. It is relatively easier to correlate incidence of cancer with dose at higher dose levels as the frequency of cancer occurrence is high at higher doses. Please try to remember it. If dose received by a population or a number of people is high, the frequency of occurrence of cancer is high in them and that is why high means when I say high, high higher than naturally occurring cancer and that is why it's easier to score and correlate dose with frequency of cancer incident. The problem is it is at the low dose levels where cancer risk estimation has remained difficult. This is where risk modeling becomes important. That is the need of risk model because here a normal experiment will not give you the results because the incidence of cancer at low doses are not very high. You can't distinguish them from naturally occurring cancers and hence risk modeling becomes important. So where does it come from mainly? As I was telling you earlier, lifespan study of the atomic bomb survivors is one crucial study for risk estimation. And who have done maximum studies in this area? The organization committees, United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effect of Atomic Radiation, which is called UNSCARE. Then National Academy of Sciences Committee on the Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation, BEIR. And based on the research through these organizations, there is another important organization called International Commission on Radiological Protection, which then gives recommendations on risks, what are the various risks involved in radiation, and based on that, again, gives what should be the permissible type of radiation in various activities. For example, based on the ICRP, which is an international body, various national nations have their own councils or radiation protection agencies. US has National Council on Radiation Protection Measurement, NCRP. In India, we have Atomic Energy Regulatory Board. Now, before we go a little further, let's familiarize ourselves, ourselves with the risk terminology. So one term that is used is relative risk. The incidence of disease, that is its rate, in an exposed population divided by the incidence of disease in the population that was not exposed. So IEP, population exposed, incidence of a disease in population exposed divided by INP population not exposed. This is what relative risk is defined. Expressed in, how is it expressed? Relative risk per gray. Gray is what? It is a unit of dose, radiation dose. Or there is one more unit which we will be discussing in another module which is called effective dose and the unit for that is sievert. So relative risk is expressed as per unit gray or per unit sievert. Then there is one more term, excess relative risk, which is called ERR. This is expressed as the number of excess cases. That means cases could be just incidence or mortality per population size. And what is the population size generally taken? 10 is to 5 to 10 to 6. That means 1 lakh to 10 lakh. That is about a million people 
per unit of time and what is the time taken typically per year and dose per unit dose as i told you gray or sever also this is also referred excess relative risk is also referred to as attributable risk this is independent on spontaneous cancer incidence as i was telling you there are cancer incidence in a population whether they receive radiation or no radiation that's called natural incidence of radiation so this excess relative risk term is independent of spontaneous cancer risk a relative risk of two or an ERR excess relative risk of one means a doubling of the risk for example if you calculate as I told you earlier that the value of RR relative risk is two or value of ERR is one that means there is a double of risk of cancer incidence in that population double from the naturally occurring cancers now what is the other term excess attributable risk that I told you is also expressed in terms of how do you express it number of cases per population and the population I told you could be 1 lakh or 10 lakh per year per sever and the other way of expressing the risk is lifetime attributable risk again number of cases per 1 lakh of population per sievert of dose now the radiogenic cancer risk models are not different from as i told you in the very beginning carcinogenesis whether from radiation from any other mutagen looks similar but for radiation carcinogenesis the models based on these various studies done by these organizations unscare biER and recommendation of icrp suggest the problem comes at low doses what risk model to follow at low doses so from radiation protection of point of view as we will read or we will discuss in our radiation protection module generally there are one model is risk model is linear no threshold model that means whatever is the risk at higher doses the same risk extrapolated to low doses linearly will follow this is one model then there is another model linear quadratic model that means risk initially is low but as the dose increases the risk increases in a quadratic, quad, quadratic manner that means increases very exponentially that is another model the most of the time we follow the li linear no threshold model that means there is no threshold dose below which cancer risk does not happen and there is risk at every dose however low dose that, that may be so that is what the risk model called LNT linear no threshold dose means what are the various risk coefficients as I was telling relative risk estimates per uh, percentage that means per C word how many people are likely to develop cancer in a population per whole population the International Commission on Radiological Protection in its report number 103 issued in 2007 said that for whole population the risk is 5.5 percent per sievert what does that mean it means 5.5 out of 100 people exposed to one sievert dose will develop cancer this is for whole population and what is it for adults and for adults this risk is 4.1 percent per sievert that means out of 100 persons exposed to one sievert of dose 4.1 are likely to develop a cancer now what are the various sources of radiation sources of radiation and what is the average dose received by the public from these various sources when i say public it is little different from radiation workers public is not involved in a radiation work directly for its profession or for any gain for that matter so that's public cosmic rays everybody is equally exposed depending on of course where altitude and latitude of the place but all people whether they are radiation workers or not radiation worker they are exposed to cosmic rays and what is this average contribution 0.5 millisievert per year similarly radon gas from soils and rocks what is this contribution about 1.0 millisievert per year gamma rays from ground floor ground floor or walls about 0.5 to 1 millisievert per year so this all con constitutes the 
natural background and what is the natural background radiation that we receive public receives about 2.0 millisievert per year this is natural radiation that everybody is receiving then comes the man made sources for example medical exposure the contribution is about 0.3 millisievert per year environmental that means nuclear industry fallout etc 0.01 millisievert per year and occupational coming from public to occupational workers means workers who are engaged in radiation work nuclear industry it is about 2 millisievert per year medical radiation that means medical workers 0.2 millisievert per year surprisingly air crew receives about 2 millisievert per year more than medical people working in medical industry uranium mine miners receives the maximum about 10 to 15 millisievert per year now what are the risk factors women have higher risk than men and we have all this has all been estimated from various studies and from the attributable lifetime risk models excess risk continues throughout life age plays a critical role for cancer risk the data suggests that children and young adults are much more susceptible to radiation radiation induced cancer than the older age population now there is one more theory which is called radiation homesis i had initially touched up on this word and what does it say this radiation homesis that at low doses that is at the level of almost background natural background radiation radiation helps immunize cells against dna damage and decreases the risk of cancer this theory proposes that such low level radiation activates the body dna repair mechanism the idea of radiation homesis is generally considered unacceptable by the regulatory bodies world over who are involved in radiation protection friends to summarize our this module on radiation carcinogenesis radiation carcinogenesis is a st stochastic process that means it's a probabilistic process there are multiple hypotheses on the mechanism of radiation carcinogenesis the malignant transformation of a cell and subsequent formation of tumor needs alteration in many cellular and molecular functions the alteration should be irreversible for the transformation to happen the later is a time dependent process the existing evidence indicates the genes such as oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes do play a role in radiation carcinogenesis radiation can induce malignancies such as leukemia breast cancer lung cancer bone cancer etc the radiogenic cancer are indistinguishable from cancers caused by other chemical and physical factors or from naturally occurring cancers it is difficult to predict cancer risk at low level doses and hence risk models are used to predict the risks these models are based on several sources of data such as animal experiments atomic bomb survivors and medical application of radiation it has been observed that children and young adults are more susceptible to radiation induced cancers than old age population thank you